that started. All right, it's, it's going now. Um, well, as I've said, I have been really looking forward to, to this event as it is this format, um, at least, um, but for a long time. Uh, as I distinctly remember when I was going through with, with Rachel, um, the publishers of Inscrits, and I, I come across this, this crazy book with a gorgeous cover called Enter the Aardvark. I read the description and uh, Rachel and I were just like, oh my God, this sounds wonderful. I think we could both do great things with it. And I said, okay, uh, but I want it for Booktopia. Um, and so I immediately wrote uh, our, our rep from Hachette and she sent me a copy of it and I just devoured it instantaneously. I read it in just a, a couple of days. Um, I passed it around to other booksellers. I passed it around to, to family members and friends. Um, I, I can't, it's, it's, one of, it's my favorite novel of the year so far. Um, it grabs you, it doesn't let you go. There's wonderful things to say about it. All these reviews you can read, I, I read them today. They're all, you know, glowing. Um, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, it's all, all superlatives here uh, for Enter the Aardvark. Um, it's a, and it's a great pleasure to host uh, Jessica Anthony. Um, so please welcome. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thank you so much, Rachel, everyone from Northshire. It's really tremendously exciting for me to be here this afternoon. So thank you. And thank you for your kind words, very kind words about the novel. I really appreciate it and for sharing it so, so widely with everyone. And I also just want to give a big shout out and hello to all the upstate New Yorkers who are with us today because I am from upstate New York. I grew up in Hamilton. So I just want to say, go upstate, power, power to the people. Um, so, so yeah, Enter the Aardvark. Uh, let's see, I thought I would just start by giving you a little bit of a sense for how this novel came to be. Um, and then I'm just gonna read a short excerpt from um, two of the sections that appear in the intertwining narratives. Um, so Enter the Aardvark began actually with the title um, back in 2012. Uh, I, I will often write from titles. There's something about just sort of the energy of a scrap of poetry or a gathering of words that somehow perks my interest and piques my interest. And I just, I don't know, I can't let go. I can't stop thinking about it. And so this phrase, enter the aardvark, came into my mind in 2012 and I just sort of sat on it for about three years. Um, and then in 2015, in the run up to the 2016 election, I had the sense that I was interested in writing some kind of a, a novel that engaged politics and political fiction. Um, and I wondered, you know, perhaps, you know, this political interest might somehow marry itself with this gathering of words that I had been thinking about. Um, and so I sat down to begin writing and sure enough, they belonged together. Um, it, very, it became very much a, a novel engaging, you know, questions and, um, sort of dicey, complicated moral angles that sort of circumnavigate around the socio-political spheres in contemporary America. Um, but the, the novel really also began for me with voice. Um, the novel begins with sort of a wild and unhinged, um, you know, like a, a six, like a six page kind of, um, you know, uh, I don't know, how can I describe this? It's the evolution of the aardvark and it's, and it's written very quickly um, and in a voice that to me um, is a, a kind of hyperbolic, um, a, a hyperbolic sound that sort of speaks to, you know, infinity, um, just to the infinity of evolution. Um, and so, and how we are still, you know, evolving. We are still responding to our environments and we're still changing. And so I wanted to kind of capture the speed of our present moment. Now this was pre-quarantine. I fully recognize that we've all stopped. <laughs> um, but in the moment, of course, writing, uh, you know, leading right into the quarantine, I don't know about some of you folks, but I was feeling like the world was just moving so fast and everyone, was just feeling constantly overwhelmed with information and with speed. Um, and our, our interest and, and almost kind of perverse pleasure in rushing to indictment um, sort of went, was interesting me. And I was also interested in um, the sound of uh, sort of hipster speech and millennial speech. Um, I was reading a number of articles about kind of, you know, who, who this new generation was and how they were going to kind of assume power. Um, and I was just fascinated by 
this kind of um, valley girl meets business school, lang you know, sound in language. And so all of these things were kind of, you know, just tumbling around and I didn't really know what to do with them. So, you know, I sat down and I, I started to write the present day story, which follows Alexander Payne Wilson, a Republican congressman who receives one hot day in August, a gigantic taxidermic aardvark on his front stoop that completely brings down his reelection campaign in under two days. Um, and so the speed of this, you know, protagonist and, you know, indictment, the speed of his downfall was really what kind of set the tone and set the momentum of the book for me. Um, and I was experimenting a little bit with point of view. Point of view is what I think uh, it per is personally one of the most important choices a novelist can make. Um, and I started writing a little bit in the first person for Alex Wilson, but, um, you know, Alex Wilson is, you know, he is racist, he is sexist, he's bigoted in basically every possible way you can imagine, um, you know, a contemporary GOP nihilist to be bigoted, um, and unambivalently so. I mean, he just sort of accepts it as part of his role as, uh, you know, to a plea, to, a, to, you know, please somebody like Mitch McConnell. So, so Alex Wilson, you know, he's, he's a bit of a beast. And so I wanted to find a point of view that would allow me to sort of be interested in sort of a horrible villain, right, as, as a character. Um, and so the first person just didn't interest me. That I voice felt so suffocating and insular. Um, so I began to play around with the second person and found in the second person this beautiful ability to move between empathy and indictment for Alex Wilson. Because, you know, I wasn't interested in just writing a villain or writing a monster and having him kind of be, a, you know, cartoonish in that way. I really wanted to kind of, um, kind of provoke or investigate really what might be behind some of this, you know, intransigence that we see um, in contemporary politics and in, in political stances. Um, and so after I had, I had affirmed for myself, you know, the point of view for Alex Wilson, um, it, which was just really fun uh, and, al and allowed all kinds of finger pointing, which was really an enjoyable thing to do. Um, I found that I was following the aardvark as I was writing this character. So he received this giant taxidermied aardvark. So I began to investigate, you know, taxidermy and where this aardvark might have come from. And it actually brought me all the way back to 1875. And it brought me to England. Um, and suddenly I found myself writing a parallel narrative of Titus Downing, the taxidermist in 1875 who lived in Leamington Spa, who stuffed the aardvark. And I, you know, I just, I didn't really know what I was doing. I just trusted that I was doing something, you know, that's how novelists write. There's usually very little plan, you know, you just kind of trust it and, and have faith in the process. Um, but, you know, I really, I started to fall in love with my, with my Victorian taxidermist. And I was fascinated by his, his difficulty that he was encountering while trying to stuff the aardvark and trying to see the aardvark because he'd never seen one before. Um, and, and to him, it appeared kind of monstrous and irrational. Um, and I began to see these parallels between this irrational looking aardvark and the irrational hypocrisy of a contemporary GOP politician who lives one way in, uh, in public are, and votes one way in public and lives another way in private. Um, so as, as we move through the novel, we begin to realize, um, you know, the, really the ramifications of, um, you know, choosing to deny yourself your own desires and how there is obviously a, a you know, a great degree of um, self-loathing and um, the lack of self-knowledge that comes with that choice to deny yourself who you really are and what you want, you know, for, for other reasons like vanity or, or blind ambition. Um, but they also have consequences for the rest of us. When you are put into a place uh, where you have political power and you are casting votes based on um, an unwillingness to recognize the complexity within, um, there are ramifications for the rest of us, right, who have to suffer um, you know, the outcomes of your, of your voting preference, right? Um, and so if your voting preference is coming from a cynical place, then that actually has 
um, in, you know, in my, from my perspective, very serious outcomes um, for us, which is why I now, when I talk about the novel, I talk about it as a feminist cri de coeur um, told through complicated moral angling, which is to say um, the story of four gay men, two living in 1875 England and two in contemporary Washington, D.C. Um, so that's kind of the general rundown of the book. I, I, I've been rambling a little bit here, folks, so thanks for bearing with me. Um, but I thought I'd give you a, just a taste of it now. If that, what do you think, Duff? Does that sound good? Yeah. So I'm going to read you uh, a section first from uh, 1875 from Titus Downing, where he has just received this aardvark. He's been working on stuffing a, a, you know, a very large Bengal tiger, which he's had to put aside because the aardvark has arrived. Uh, and then after that section, I'm going to move into the contemporary story of Alex Wilson, where he has received the aardvark and um, he recognizes that it is actually a gift from his lover, Greg Tampico. Um, and he has just texted Greg Tampico asking him, you know, essentially, why did you send me this aardvark? So that's where we are. Titus Downing, consciously unmarried, consciously childless, aficionado not only of taxidermy, but also of very fine, very thin oxtail soup, gazes at the humped back and smooth neck, the fat claws, the ears and snout so oddly long, it looks like someone pulled them in shutters. Next to the Bengal tiger, this so-called aardvark is a truly vulgar creature, he thinks, ugly even for nature, like a pig screwed a donkey, and immediately reminds Downing of a story famous among taxidermists, that of Captain John Hunter, who in 1798 sent the first skin and sketch of a platypus to naturalists in England, who in turn assumed it was a hoax. They thought someone had sewn a duck's bill onto a beaver pelt, going so far as to write that upon viewing the creature, it is impossible not to entertain doubts and all surmise that there might have been practiced some art of deception, which is why Downing, wondering if his close friend Richard Oslick could have sent him a hoax, inspects the skin for unnatural seams and finds that there are no unnatural seams. Downing returns to his workbench. He closes his eyes and tries to quiet himself back into the life of the Bengal tiger, but it is impossible. The tiger's moment has passed. It will likely find days to find it again, and his mind is traveling helplessly back to the aardvark until at last he gives up and goes to it, realizing with growing excitement that Oslet has offered him not a joke, but a challenge. How to recreate the jiva of a beast as ugly as this one, a creature about which no civilized man knows anything. The notes and sketches which Oslet has sent him now appear to Downing to be almost deliberately sparse, nocturnal, sleeps in underground tunnels, you social entomological eater, has cheek teeth, throws snout into ground to smell deeply, digs with front feet, kicks dirt with back feet, bark is high pitched such as a wanting dog, exit the tiger, enter the aardvark, Downing's bony fingers cross the pelage. The skin is first pink and then yellow, the fur an inexplicable mixture of wire and silk, and it's brown at the hind limbs, which are plantigrade at the front, digitigrade at the back, and Oslet's hunters always do a very fine job, he thinks, as his hands touch the beast's rear feet, which take up half the leg. Then it's the heavy claws, each digit wide as a spoon, and what strength in the tail, Downing thinks, how it glides right up the back, which is round as a tortoise, and he closes his eyes and imagines the aardvark using the tail muscle for balance in her under underground tunnels to avoid bumping her wide body into narrow walls, and Downing can now clearly see the aardvark lumbering on her large legs past huge termite mounds. They look like sandcastles built by ambitious, imbecilic children. And there's the great hulk of shoulder gliding beneath the skin, the fat swing of belly, and Downing now knows her weight and tour, her erratic mood, and when she runs, she rises surprisingly up onto her tippy toes, so much so she fairly prances, her conical head aloft with donkey ears that flick upward at any rustle of subterranean insect activity, and he can almost feel the scrabble of the loose soil as she thrusts her spoons into the earth to begin burrowing. The dirt smells of sugar. He can almost taste the nectar of termites now on his own sticky tongue until morning arrives and enter the bark, the soft piggy squeal, don't wake me in daylight. 
into the fatigue, bones burning after a night ambling on these bizarre haunches. And when she sleeps, she curls her fat body into a comma and down and can feel the light purr of the beast's slimy lips during slumber, her nostrils shuddering open then closed. And there goes the slip of the serpentine tongue in and out from her small mouth as she dreams about her own hunger. And it is now because Downing can see into the dreams of the ugly, vulgar, exhausted aardvark that he begins to understand that despite its appalling morphology, beauty is possible. Greg Tampico does not text back. Greg Tampico always texts back. A chill creeps your neck as the stuffed aardvark standing underneath a floor lamp watches you pace in your living room. The way it's mounted, the front right claw slightly lifted, the long snouted head slightly askew, ears alert, akimbo. The aardvark appears to be in the middle of walking to someplace important, like you've interrupted it doing its job. And the last thing you need right now is to feel you are like bothering somebody in your own house. But the creature's expression, while you never thought much about it in Greg Tampico's walk up, here in your living room with your furniture precisely chosen to look like a townhouse Ronald Reagan might have enjoyed, is now looking, let's face it, like incredibly odd. And you know that as soon as Congress is back in session and representatives Rutledge and Olioke are back in the townhouse, you will have to suffer their questions about the aardvark and frankly, you have no idea what in the hell you're gonna tell them. You go upstairs, you wanna take a shower. Your shower is a Kohler vibrant brushed bronze water tile ambient rain overhead rain shower, which costs $4,125. So you like taking showers. The water is cold, it feels good, it's so hot out. You must be feeling this way from the heat, you think. And since Greg Tampico is not texting back, you decide while drying off with your $339 hair mace, sarcoline, terry cloth body towel that the easiest solution is to drive the aardvark to Alexandria and simply return it to him. Mother of God, you think, what a pain in the ass as you dress yourself head to toe in light casual summer wear from J. Crew. When you return to the living room, the aardvark looks at you like you are ridiculous. Oh no, you don't, you say. You've spoken out loud to a stuffed aardvark. You feel ridiculous. You go into the kitchen and eat a few grapes. While in the kitchen, which is Florida ceiling white subway tile decked out in $6,000 worth of Williams Sonoma that you never use, an epiphany. You open a cabinet. You remove a flour sack. It is a clean white flour sack with a ragged edge to make it look vintage. And your decorator bought all these freaking flour sacks. You have no idea why, but they're folded like new t-shirts in a cabinet in your kitchen. So you grab one and go back to the living room. Though you feel stupid doing it, you cover the face of the aardvark with a flour sack. Then, using your back and your knees like your old gym teacher taught you, you actually hoist the bastard, carrying it downstairs to the small dark garage of 2486 Asher Place where your car, a black Chevy Tahoe, is waiting. You leased the Tahoe just a few weeks ago for 600 monthly, and how pleased are you that the Tahoe is already proving itself useful as you fling open the rear doors and pull down the back seats. Remarkably, the aardvark fits. It's like the engineers planned it. The trunk, luxurious and roomy, can fit a whole African aardvark. You slam the doors, climb into the driver's seat, and turn on the AC in Soldier Boy full blast. You hit the garage door button and the machine hums as the door rises. The garage floods with sunlight. You pull out onto the street, checking your phone. Though it's just 8.52 a.m., you now have 233 text messages and 97 emails, but this is again standard. You locate Greg Tampico's address on King Street in Alexandria, stab the GPS button, and are able to relax for the first time today as the Tahoe, worth every penny, knows what to do. Thanks. I'll stop there. Oh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we did. Thank you okay. so much. It's, it's so good. I, I love this book so much. I, I just I'd say all the... Um, Wonderful things. Well, anyway, thank you for sharing that. It's, uh, I think you're all going to love this. Has anyone read it yet? Um, I know a few of you have. I saw a few of you having copies of it. Looks like there's some laughs and smiles here. Um, well, uh, if anyone has any questions, um, please let us know. Uh, please put, put them in the chat. But I thought I'd ask a couple to start with. Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, uh, Jessica, I, I feel uh, really bad that this uh, great novel was published during quarantine, um, <laughs> and uh, sorry about that. Oh, you're very kind. It's okay. I'm over it. <laughs> how is uh, what I mean? You've been doing these these virtual events. Um, yes. How's it been? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been fine. I mean, you know, uh, we were chatting a little bit about this earlier, but it, it's it's actually kind of nice because I think it gives access to folks who 
wouldn't maybe necessarily have the ability to come to a bookstore, you know, uh, and and actually, you know, visit and do and do the in person reading. And so I've actually felt quite fortunate in that I've been seeing, um, you know, some some pretty robust showings for these events, which is really tremendous. I mean, I've given readings in bookstores before to like three people. So um, I, you know, I think in some ways it's actually kind of a blessing. You know, you've got to just be positive about it. Um, yeah. <laughs> So. Uh, all right, well, well, moving on, how, so you, you talked a little bit about how you've got this, this voice, uh, this character's voice, and it brought in, you had the title, Enter the Aardvark, and you, um, so how did these, one of the things I, I think is so remarkable about the novel is the way these two narratives sort of dovetail and inform each other. And I, in fact, I had some, um, some arguments with, with my wife about how much of one narrative do we take into the next one. Um, how, did you, how did you come to construct it in such a brilliant way? Oh, thank you. Um, you know, I, I said this before, but I really, I believe that, um, well, first of all, let me just say that um, I think there's a lot of mythology about plot. Um, that when we start out writing fiction, we kind of give ourselves these certain rules and these, and these stories about what you should and shouldn't do as a writer. And um, all through, you know, my, my education, I was, you know, roundly advised to write what, what's considered or called sort of character-driven fiction. You know, is there, are you a plot-driven writer or a character-driven writer? But the more you write stories and fiction, I think the more you realize kind of what a false choice that is. That actually, of course, if, as soon as a character appears on the page and thinks anything and moves in any capacity, that's plot. Something's happening. Um, and so I think as, as that, that, that's a piece of it, I would say, that as soon as you give yourself permission to just write the story in the way that feels truest to you without you know, concerning yourself with the purported rules, um, you know, you, you realize that you have a lot more freedom, you know, than you, than you previously thought. Um, but it, but I also realized that I actually quite, um, was addicted to the plot. I mean, this is one of the only fictions I've written ever, and this has happened to me a couple of times as a writer, but this, this, uh, this novel is definitely one of these times where you wake up in the morning and you run to your computer to keep writing it. I mean, you're just absolutely addicted to the story. Um, and it's rare that that happens. I mean, most times it's like you're a gladiator in the ring and you're just fighting for the story, you know, and you're really trying to ring it out. But this just felt like the story, it knew itself, it needed to be told. Um, and so I trusted that mysterious authority and I just ran with it. Um, and, as I, and as I wrote, I began to realize um, that there were, you know, con there was connective tissue between these two stories. Sometimes it is oblique and other times it's obvious. Um, I was, I, I, in my mind, I consider these four central characters, these four men to be very distinct. They are separate couples. Um, you know, even though there is a lot of conversation about reincarnation in the novel, for me personally, I see them as, as four distinct individuals. Um, uh, but, but they did provide uh, an opportunity for kind of some larger, you know, themes and conversations about religion, about spirituality, and about identity that I was surprised by. Um, and so I just allowed myself to traverse and to move between the two stories and where I would find a commonality or a crossover, I would study it and ask myself, is this a cartoon? Is this, you know, too ham-fisted or, or do, does this actually work? Does it make sense? And I think part of what I love about this novel personally is that um, it does have a kind of exaggerated and hyperbolic quality. And so as soon as I allowed myself to just kind of go for it, um, and not, you know, be too concerned about, you know, the overlapping, suddenly I felt like there was actually some miraculous truth telling going on. Um, and it's not going to be to everyone's taste, and I don't think every novel should be. Um, Vonnegut has the famous line, if you open a window and try to make love to the world, your story will get pneumonia. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, you, you, you write the story that you most want to read. So for me, that meant being open to plot in new ways, um, being open to point of view and voice in new ways, and um, really just kind of having faith in the logic of the fiction. Um, as soon as, uh, you know, a complication 
would appear, I would find, you know, all sorts of various ways to answer it. And so I would be constantly asking myself while I was writing, well, what's most logical? You know, what, what you know, reasonably would happen next? Um, and that, you know, that worked for me. I don't know. That made sense to me. Yeah. I had a sort of a nuts and bolts writing question, which was, as you were writing this, you know, with the two separate storylines, the two separate time periods, did you find it hard not to play favorites? Did you find yourself more drawn into one story than the other and having to force yourself back and forth? Or, or, or did you write them both separately and then Frankenstein them together? That's such a great question. No, I, I wrote it as it's read. I mean, I just moved back and forth as I went. Um, but I love that you're asking that question about what I had more, sort of more of an affinity towards. And I, I would say that I love them. They're kind of like children, right? I mean, <laughs> these two narratives are very different. Um, but you love them both the same, I mean, despite their differences. And so um, I would say that I began to see, you know, a, a, an opening for empathy for Alex Wilson through the writing of Titus Downing. And, and that surprised me. I didn't fully anticipate when I realized what I was doing. I didn't expect that to happen. Um, but, I, but I began to realize that like part of the reason why we are able to, at least I hope, feel some measure of human concern for Alex by the end of the novel is because of Titus Downing. Uh, it's because, you know, his repression belongs to, you know, a history. He has an entire past that even though it's on another continent and it's in another era, it's in another century, um, it's part of his experience. Um, and so, you know, I think that is sitting in the reader's subconscious as they're reading Ty uh, Alex Wilson. You know, Titus is there. They've just read him. And so they're going to bring it into the next section, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's, you've got this wonderful, brilliantly constructed farce that just sends him into this, uh, sends Alex into this, this moment of, you know, the, the re-election is, is not going to happen. But it's yeah. also this tender love story um, with yes. Titus. And then, the, the, and you, you keep, you do feel for him. And even, you know, I'm not to give anything away, but even at the end, you're like, oh, um, there's like moments still in the, he hasn't really, okay, I don't want to say anymore, but. No, you can say that. <laughs> he's kind of reconstructed in some ways, but you still have yeah. these same feelings for him. Like the, the, how you end with him, I think is great. And his little, the cupcake or the muffin. The muffin, yeah. The famous lemon poppy seed muffin. <laughs> um, anyway, it's, it's, it's wonderful. We've got a question here from uh, Carol, mm -hmm. who's wondered, has there been any talk about turning this into a film? It seems to me that this would make a great movie. Oh, thank you, Carol. Um, yes, uh, actually, as we speak, the... Um, the story, the novel has been optioned. We're working on the contract right now. So um, I don't know if it's gonna be a film or um, you know, a, a limited TV series, but I think that's, in, that, that's gonna be pitched. Who knows if it'll happen, but it would be delicious if it does. It would be wonderful. I, would, I mean, I would love to see someone's you know, visual interpretation of the novel. I think it'd be fascinating. Yeah. Well, congratulations. That's, um, that's fantastic news for, yeah, it's exciting. for the novel and, and for you. Uh, how, how, how wonderful. Um, one of the, Ronald Reagan is a major force in this novel and kind of, um, kind of an engine of comic hilarity, uh, his <laughs> pouches and his clothes and a, and a vial of his blood. How did that, um, how did that come to you? How did you, that, well, you know, I, I, something that I've, I've noticed in the last, you know, 10 years is this um, this burgeoning worship of Ronald Reagan. And I just find it fascinating. And so I wanted to um, play with that a little bit. I, I tried to kind of take that sensibility at, to the utmost, which is to say, Alex Wilson, he collects, he creepily is collecting Ronald Reagan's clothing and his furniture because he's, you know, the, the, this is the degree to which he is trying to aspire, you know, to be the consummate you know, modern day GOP candidate. I mean, he wants to have this kind of grace and elegance, but he's actually kind of a little bit of a trashy guy. Um, and so he's just perpetually, he's trying and it's hero worship, you know? Um, but it was, it was really fun. I was actually like combing through images of Ronald Reagan and I came across this marvelous quote that's in the novel that actually was said by a Senator in the eighties working with Reagan, that looking at Ronald Reagan was like looking at a tree in autumn. 
And I just loved that line, you know? I mean, there's something just so beautiful about it. And so um, as soon as I, you know, realized that uh, the, the, the worship of Ronald Reagan and the gathering of his clothes, uh, as soon as I realized that like this was actually a big piece of, of Alex's own kind of psychological development into sort of his blindness, right? Um, we, we eventually learn in the novel um, that there's an intersection with um, Namibia, with Namibian culture and with um, uh, Namibian dress and performance. The Namibians, uh, the Herero and the Nama, I don't know if anyone knows this, but it's, it's the first genocide of the 20th century actually took place in Namibia and um, it was the German colonists who were using strategies on the Nama and Herero that they actually um, you know, took into the, the Second World War that the Nazis actually appropriated from this early kind of experiment on, on African people in the, at the turn of the century. And so if you go online and you read about the Herero and the Nama, you can, you can see images of, um, you know, these, these people who dress like they're oppressors, right? They're wearing um, these, these African fabrics that are Victorian garments and um, the men are dressed like German soldiers, right? And so I, I was riveted. I mean, I just thought, well, God, that's exactly what Alex isn't doing, you know? And so this beautiful parallel between, you know, the question emerged, right? It, is it better to, you know, wear the clothes of your hero or the clothes of your enemy, right? And where does empathy really come from? So that, that was a surprise, a total discovery and, and magical surprise for me in the novel. I didn't see it coming and it was just, one of those amazing um, intersections of history that I I just didn't expect, um, but but was there at, at the ready when you know when I got there. Yeah. So Reagan, uh, gotta love Reagan, and I also you know I grew up with Ronald Reagan. I mean I don't know I'm a child of the '80s and like I just remember his, seeing him on TV, and I remember sort of you know his kind of tone of voice and his speeches always sounded like a performance to me. I mean, obviously he was an actor. And, and I think when you're a little kid, kids are, kids are really intuitive. I mean, it just struck me as disingenuous, even as a little kid. So I don't know, I, there's something farcical and kind of cartoonish about Reagan in my, in my imagination anyway, I suppose, so. <laughs> there's a great question from Diane in the chat. Um, she asks if you would mind clarifying the title. She says, I know you said that the title drove you at first, but how did you come up with it back in 2012? just popped into my head. It's so terrible to say, but it's true. I mean, I think it, I actually started out writing poetry. Uh, and I, I guess I've always been kind of attuned to language and I don't know, I'm always just kind of thinking about words, you know, it's just who I am. Um, and uh, I was actually, I was in New York City and I was giving a reading at uh, a place called Joe's Pub. And it's actually, it's kind of, it's a great place. You give a reading and then you have to embarrass yourself after the reading. You have to do something like publicly embarrassing. So I was, um, I was doing a, like, a, I know sign language. I went to a, a sign language summer camp. So I signed the opening to Flashdance, you know, that movie Flashdance, like what a feeling. So I gave a reading and I signed what a feeling. And then after I got down from the stage, um, you know, I was just thinking about, the next book, I don't know, it's like, all right, kiddo, time to start thinking about your, you know, your next book after having signed What a Feeling in New York City. And, and Enter the Aardvark just popped into my head as, as a little gathering of words. Um, and I, I don't know, I just thought, thought it was sort of a funny, a funny phrase. The, the surrealist poet Andre Breton um, famously will call this a waking sentence. So if any of you are out there and you're writing, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's just that moment where you have this little scrap of language that feels alive to you. It wants to be investigated and it wants to be answered. Um, and so, yeah, it, but it, it, it sat with me, you know, I, I also believe in patience as, an, as a fiction writer and I, you know, you want to wait for the right time. You don't want to force it. So I didn't rush right home and write into the aardvark. I just let it kind of sit with me and to see how I sort of felt about it. You know, it's kind of like, when you're picking out a name for something, you know, you have to like sit with the name and is that really right for that thing, you know? Um, but I also, had, I was reading a, quite a bit of Thomas Pynchon and the opening um, sentence in uh, Gravity's Rainbow also was something I was thinking about, you know, a screaming comes across the sky. And so 
suddenly there was this other rush of language, whirling mass of vapors is unhinged, hurtling throughout a space for an infinity until it collides with an ellipsis, which does not let go, and on and on and on, and that begins the novel. So there was something about this rush of language and this speed and the weirdness of this, these three words enter the aardvark that just provoked my curiosity. And I would say this, I mean, if you're curious about anything as a writer, you know, that's, that's where the gold is. You've got to just find your answers to what it is that you're curious about. Because we often don't know what we're curious about, you know? Much in, much in the same way when we're writing characters, um, our characters don't even know what they really want, you know? Um, until until you, you make the discovery for them and then suddenly, you know, the epiphany is possible or the revelation is possible, you know? I think um, opening with this, it, it's, Unheard of. I mean, I could I can't think of another novel that has this such a strange sort of miraculous opening this with, from the Big Bang to the evolution of the aardvark. It's like this teleological thing that ends with such a strange creature. Um, it's, <laughs> uh, um, but Diane had a follow up in the chat uh, and she's saying, um, so uh, taxidermy information uh, came to you after you started the book. So it was originally the word aardvark and then the taxidermy element came into it subsequently. Oh, yes, definitely. I didn't even know that I was writing a taxidermied aardvark. I mean, I wrote the opening and then suddenly I had a dead aardvark on my hands, you know, um, and I didn't even ex expect particularly to follow the aardvark, but that's just kind of where the plot was leading me. And so after the stuffed aardvark had arrived at Alex Wilson's doorstep, I was like, all right, I've got a stuffed aardvark on my hands, right? Now, what's a stuffed aardvark? Um, well, it's, ta it's a taxidermy aardvark. Well, let's learn about some taxidermy, you know? Um, so then suddenly I find myself, you know, mired in Victorian methodologies for taxidermy, you know? I mean, obviously there, there was no guideline for how someone might have stuffed an aardvark back in 1875, but taxidermy was actually a huge piece of the culture in Victorian England. Um, they were quite macabre, the, the Victorians, but there was a famous exhibition, uh, the Hyde Park exhibition in 1850, where all the taxidermists came and they had displayed their, you know, their birds and their animals. And so it, that became like a logical kind of point in the novel from which Titus Downing would have grown, um, you know, as a taxidermist where he would have kind of found his career. And he meets, you know, and here's Charles Darwin and um, so there's, so there's a kind of lot, there, again, there's a logic to it, right? You ask yourself, all right, now, where would a, a taxidermy aardvark, like, where might that have appeared and generated from? And that begins to answer questions and feed into the character who's living in that time, right? So then suddenly, it just makes sense that you're moving back and forth between the aardvark in the present day being wedged into a giant SUV, you know, a Chevy Tahoe, and an aardvark you know, being artfully constructed in this dim taxidermy shop um, in Leamington Spa, which, and the actual location of uh, Titus Downing's shop was the actual location of a, a former taxidermy store in, in Leamington Spa in the 1870s. I also found this tremendous, um, uh, tremendously useful bit of research from um, a fellow named Montague Brown. I mean, come on, Montague Brown. And he is it, just called a, a you know, manual of taxidermy, but it had all of these wild kind of strategies for taxidermy in, uh, in the Victorian era that was just, I mean, I was riveted. I thought it was so interesting. So, so that's how it came to be. Yeah. That actually makes me think, uh, one of the things that I had wondered about was, it seems like you must have had to do an almost infinite amount of research for this book. I mean, the number of different things you had to look into. Was it hard to cut yourself off? No, because, you know, for me, um, research is, is kind of knowing myself, weirdly. Um, you know, I think, I think there's, a, there's a, again, a little bit of a mythology about how research works in fiction, and it certainly can work to your disadvantage because you can you can lose yourself in the research and then lose track of your story, lose the energy of your story, the kind of energeia, right? The praxis, that's what Aristotle called it. And so, you know, if you're losing the praxis, that means like you're becoming more interested in the information than the characters. And so I was just, you know, I just, I became interested in the research, but I never, I never wanted it to dominate in the fiction. And so it had to become a natural part of the voice. And, you know, because I just love language and words so much, 
Um, I just, I allowed myself to kind of play with a lot of the language that I had uncovered, especially in the Victorian taxidermy sections, like learning about, um, you know, the morphology of the aardvark and how the, the Victorians might have described its forelegs and hind legs and the, the quasi-scientific terms that might have been bandied about back then. But it's funny, the, the book has come out in the UK and I did a UK version and I worked with an editor in the UK. And so we had fun kind of playing with some of the the Britishisms in the novel, but I lived in Britain for, for a year, so I had a little bit of access to it. Um, but it's but it's funny, it's like, so how, how much of this is yourself? I mean, it, to me, it's all myself because it all has to come back to, to voice and to character. If it doesn't, then you're really outside of the dream of your fiction and you're gonna risk losing your reader because they're just gonna say, oh, well, this is just an info dump. The writer just looked something up and that's the last thing you wanna have happen, right? So. Um, I, I mean, I think research, if artfully done, you know, it, it just becomes a natural color in the fabric of your story, right? Forgive me for speaking metaphorically, but that's that's really how I feel, yeah. Um, what are some of the, can you give an example of some of the, the Britishisms that you've, you've changed? What are, what are some of those? Sure, so um, when the taxidermist, when Titus Downing is interrupted, for example, by the delivery of the aardvark, he's hard at work on the Bengal tiger, and then a delivery boy comes and interrupts his, his process. He shouts tits in the novel, right? Tits, shouts the taxidermist. So apparently, like, he would not have said tits in Victorian England. So then we're, we're looking up all of these various um, Victorian expletives, right? And for what might have been said. And so the British version actually says butter upon bacon, which I, I kind of like better, to be honest. Like, I kind of wish that made it into the American version, but... Um, but yeah, and so, you know, the, the, the buckheads, you know, that the, there are these deer heads that line the taxidermy shop. Those are all called stag heads, you know, because that's how the word they use over there. So there are a couple of just, you know, small differences in language, but I thought were pretty funny. Yeah. What has the reception in the UK been like? Oh, it's been great. I've, I've felt very fortunate. I mean, we got a lovely review in The Guardian and a number of other places, the Sunday Times and you know, you never really know how it's going to go, and, you know, particularly with an American author, right? I mean, writing, a, you know, the British culture as an American, boy, that's risky business. Um, but people really seem to groove on it. I mean, I think they also, you know, the, the British typically, like, understand farce in a way that I think Americans, like, it's just not as common over here. Farce is not kind of written as, as often. And so they immediately understood what, what the book was up to. And, and, and my sense is that they're grooving on it. I mean, they also have similar problems politically, right? And so I think everyone's kind of just enjoying, like, you know, watching this sad demise. <laughs> this, this guy who's like, you know, making, you know, our lives so awful. Um, but, but yeah, but th then also in the end, hopefully feeling something for him despite it, yeah. I have a question about your uh, author note on the back and you have to fill us in a little bit. Okay. Um, it says here, in 2017, while writing Enter the Aardvark, Anthony was working as a bridge guard guarding the Maria Valeria Bridge between Sturovo, Sturovo and Slovakia, uh, Sturovo, Slovakia and Estergom, Hungary. Can you yes. tell us a little bit about that? That's such an interesting... Totally. Um, so the bridge guarding program uh, was set up in 2001, no, sorry, 2004. Um, and I'll give you the brief history. The bridge um, was built in 18, 1895 and it was bombed in World War I and it was rebuilt. And then the Nazis destroyed it again in World War II. And it was left that way, completely obliterated for 60 years. And so for 60 years, the people in Sturovo and Estragon were living with this daily reminder of the war. So they finally rebuilt the bridge in 2000 and, well, 2001, and then in 2004, they set up this bridge guard program. So they have artists come from all over the world to guard the bridge with their art. So it's their view that the act of creation will prevent further destruction. It will prevent fascism. So my job, I was actually, I was working on finishing the novel while I was there. Um, my job was to really, you know, closely examine the connections, the bridging that was going on between these two narratives. Um, and I would enter notes every day into the bridge log, um, which I actually just wrote an essay about this experience for the Times Literary Supplement. So hopefully that should be out in a few weeks. But, um, but yeah, it was a really wonderful summer. I mean, 
for those of you who write, you know that what you need so desperately always is time and quiet time to write. So I was so honored to get this position. You know, it gave me three months of quiet and peace to really study the novel and, um, and make sure that, you know, that it was that, that it was running smoothly. I mean, I don't know about you guys when you're writing, but like for me, I have to start at the very beginning and I have to read through the entire novel and not ask myself a single question. And as soon as I do that, I know that I'm done. So that happened by the end of that summer because I had had, you know, the gift of all of this, you know, marvelous quiet time. I speak some Slovak. I used to live in Prague. So I have a little bit of Czech and, and Slovak. So I kind of, I could get myself eggs, you know. Um, but by and large, I mean, you're, you're not, you know, really communicating with people, which is, you know, it's a good and a bad thing. You know, after three months, you're ready. You're ready to, for some conversation. But but this was also, the summer of 2017 was really like Trump hell. I mean, we're, we're, we're always in Trump hell, but I mean, that was really a bad summer. That was Charlottesville, you know? Um, and I think all of us were just kind of coming, really coming to grips with the reality of what was going on politically in this country. So it was kind of nice to, to duck out of that for a little bit and just focus on the book. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was great. I loved it. And I would cross the bridge every day. I mean, I would eat a lot of really terrible for me Hungarian pastry and drink a ton of beer. It was so good, you know. I mean, it was great. It was a great, a great job. I'll call it a job. It was a job. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love the not asking yourself a single question uh, while you're reading it. And then yeah. you know it's done. That's great. Because when I come across a question, it's like, oh, no. That's by, not in this. Um, yeah. One of the questions that we traditionally ask authors who are at, at Booktopia is if they could uh, recommend a couple of books, whether it's something that they've been reading or something that's an old favorite. Um, sure. And then we like to you know, share it with uh, the Booktopians and everyone who's attending. Definitely. A couple of books you like to recommend. Yeah, I, I strongly recommend the novel by, the most recent novel by Deb Olin Unferth, Barn 8. Um, it, it is about the heist of a million chickens um, and so much more. It's, a, it's really a brilliant book, um, brilliantly assembled, brilliantly put together. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm worried I'm going to spoil something. So I'll just say check out Barn 8 by Devil and Unferth. And the other novel that I've been, I've been recommending is by a Swiss writer, Christian Kracht. It's called Imperium. Um, and it's, it's based on the true story of August Engelhardt, who uh, was a German who went to like the remote, a remote island because he heard that there was a, like a, you know, he wanted to start a nudist colony and, and he worshiped coconuts. And it's called, I actually have it right here. It's so good. It's called Imperium. It's so funny, but it's also so beautifully written. Um, and so he, the, this writer has taken this, uh, this true story of Eng August Engelhardt and he has, you know, kind of massaged it in fiction, but then at the end, has he has reimagined a different outcome for this character? It's just, it's just beautiful. I, I just love it. So I would recommend that as well. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, German nudists, excellent. That, that, <laughs> a nudist colony. Come on, in a remote island, worshiping coconuts. Who isn't uh, on board for that? Fantastic. Um, yeah, Herman Hermann Goering Goering's father makes an appearance in Enter Enter the Aardvark. Uh, yes, he does. By the way. Heinrich. Uh, how did that happen? Is that any is any of that historical? Oh yes, absolutely. Um, well, I mean Heinrich Gehring was um, you know in cahoots with all with um, you know the Kaiser, and in the late eighteen hundreds, he was one of the the people who was um, at the forefront of bringing the Germans to South Africa and was a part of that early colonization of the area. So that was a, a, another kind of um, logical pathway in the novel that led me to the Herero and the Nama. Yeah. But it's all, yeah, but that's factually, that's true. Yeah, it all happened. Thanks. Um, if there's any other questions, please feel free to uh, type them in uh, the chat box. We'll be happy to ask, answer them, uh, ask Jessica them. Uh, does anyone else have anyone? Feel free to raise a hand. Um, I, I'd be happy to keep asking questions, but I feel like I'm, I'm dominating here because I <laughs> love this book so much. It's a fast read. It's so funny. And I think uh, the point you made about it as being farcical, it's great. You start with this little... Uh, moment and it pushes the plot forward and it just the logical consequences of, of um, yeah. what happens. It's, it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, if there aren't any other questions, thank you all so much for coming. Jessica, thank you so much for being a part thank of this. You. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. 
Um, order her book, Enter the Aardvark. Uh, as I said, it's my favorite book of the, my favorite novel of the year. Uh, I don't think anything can blast this out. It is fantastic. It's such a quick, inventive, fun, but also chewy, meaty read. Um, brilliantly written. Um, thank you again. Wonderful seeing all of you. Uh, on Tuesday of next week, we've got uh, Chris Brojalian presenting The Red Lotus. He'll be in conversation with um, Rebecca Mackay. And then on Thursday, it is uh, next, a week from today, it's Amy Meyerson, the author of another Northshire favorite, um, The Imperfections. And uh, she'll be in conversation with uh, Ali Ash, Masha Young and Ali Humans with Tiny Imperfections. Um, so thank you all so much for coming. Uh, this will be recorded and posted on YouTube in a couple of weeks after we've done a little bit of light editing. And um, hey, have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.